Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord. Deliver me from my enemies and from those who pursue me. Psalm 31, 5 and 15. I am Rob West. Those are the words of David, who suffered severe mistreatment at the hands of Saul. We're all treated unfairly from time to time. So how should we respond? Well, I'll talk about that today, and then it's on to your calls at 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is Faith and Finance, biblical wisdom for your financial journey. Okay, before we get into how we should respond when others mistreat us, I think it's important to examine ourselves first and to make sure we're not mistreating others. As Jesus says in Matthew 7, 5, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. If you find that you've treated someone unfairly, repent and make amends because you serve a just God. Proverbs 21.3 says, To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Now, what to do when you're treated unfairly? Well, it could be by a family member, a friend, a boss or coworker, or someone you're doing business with who may be trying to cheat you. Money is often the issue when we interact with others, and it's a powerful motivator to strike back when we feel we're being mistreated. Losing money we feel we deserve to have can make us feel bitter. But Hebrews 12, 15 tells us, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. You see, we live in a fallen world filled with fallen people, and we all experience mistreatment at one time or another. It's important to remember that you're one of those fallen people, too. Your first instinct might be to lash out against someone who's mistreating you. That is not a biblical response to mistreatment. Instead, look to Christ as your model. No one suffered more injustice and mistreatment than Jesus. In 1 Peter 2, 20 through 22, the apostle tells us how a Christian should respond to mistreatment. It reads, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Now, that's a pretty high bar to reach, but Peter goes on to tell us how to respond like Christ to injustice in verses 23 and 24. They read, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. You see, the key to responding like Christ to injustice is trusting God to work for good in all your affairs. Psalm 37, 4 through 6 tells us, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. One of the greatest examples of a Christ-like response to injustice is found in Genesis and the story of Joseph. He was first sold into slavery by his brothers, then wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison. Yet Joseph never reacted in an ungodly manner to injustice. He even went on to save his brothers and all of Israel when famine struck. Joseph trusted God, who eventually used Joseph's mistreatment in a powerful way. And God tests us the same way when we suffer injustice. He expects us to respond like Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that we must quietly accept every injustice that comes our way. It's not unbiblical to state your case in truth and love, but the result must be left to God. This brings up the question of whether Christians should sue or not. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, If you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? 
Paul is adamant that this is a terrible witness for Christ. He goes on to say, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But note that Paul is only talking about Christians suing other Christians in civil courts. The civil courts are ordained by God to protect us from injustice. And nowhere does the Bible say we can't use them when we're wronged outside the church. All right, your calls are next, 800-525-7000. We'll be right back. If you enjoy this radio program, you're going to love all of the many different resources waiting for you at faithfi.com. You'll find more powerful wisdom, podcasts, articles, videos, and more from partners like the National Christian Foundation, Sound Mind Investing, and Christian Healthcare Ministries. Connect with the community of thousands of Christians striving to be good and faithful stewards and check out all of the free biblical financial advice at faithfi.com. Do you feel like your hands are tied with debt, preventing you from serving God? If you have credit card debt, Christian credit counselors can help. Through our debt management program, we can get you out of credit card debt about 80% faster while honoring your debt in full. For more information on how Christian Credit Counselors can help, visit ChristianCreditCounselors.org. That's ChristianCreditCounselors.org. Or call 800-557-1985. 800-557-1985. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West. That's right. It's a new year and a new name for the broadcast, but the same content coming from God's Word helping you navigate your financial life. So what are you thinking about today? Let's talk about it. I've got three lines open. We've got some great calls that have already come in, but still room for you at 800-525-7000. That's right. The phone number hasn't changed. 800-525-7000. All right, let's dive in. We're going to begin in Homerville, Ohio. Beth, you'll be our first caller. Go right ahead. Uh, My granddaughter has some savings bonds from 1998 to 2005. She only checked one of them, but it's making 0.4%. Is there any reason she shouldn't cash these in and put them into her high interest savings account, which is 3.76%? Yeah, I do like getting them out of those bonds for the reason you mentioned, Beth. Let me ask you, though, uh, would she want to use these for qualified educational expenses for college specifically? No. Okay. Yeah, then there's not any reason to wait on redeeming those. So she can go to treasurydirect.gov. Does she have the paper bonds or are they electronic? I do not know. Okay. Well, in either case, she can get the value of them at treasurydirect.gov. Dot gov. That's the Treasury's website, the only place to go. You'd type in the QSIP number, and she could get the value, and then she'd redeem it. She would have some uh, interest that would be credited at that time, um, and at that point, she could then take this money and redeploy it somewhere else. And if she doesn't want to earmark it for either K-12 to or higher educational expenses, then, yeah, I think the key would just be, you know, perhaps using this to shore up her emergency fund, and if... Uh, uh, you know, she can do better, which she absolutely can right now in a high-yield savings account. Let's certainly do that. Um, you know, beyond emergency savings, you know, if she doesn't have a short-term need for it, she could use this to fund a Roth IRA as long as she has earned income, start putting something away for the long term. But if this is money she wants to use in the next five years, then I think keeping it safe, liquid, and yet getting a reasonable rate of return makes a lot of sense. Okay. I thank you very right. much. You're welcome, Beth. Thank you for calling. God bless you. Uh, To North Carolina. Hi, Cynthia. Thanks for calling today. Go ahead. Uh, I was calling. My question was that should you tie it on Social Security? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, we get this question a lot. And it comes from, I think, good-hearted people who just want to be faithful and honor the Lord. Uh, The challenge is it'd be very difficult to to, uh, compute, if you will, uh, what is a return of your original contributions versus what is a gain that was added to it, uh, because it's clearly, you know, you're going to ultimately get back in the form of every check more than you put in. Uh, 
And you have to recognize that there was a portion of this, unless you were self-employed, that was actually contributed by your employer as well. So, uh, you know, it becomes a pretty sophisticated math equation at that point. So, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, the Lord wants our hearts and giving is not about him getting something from us, but it's something for us. He wants us to give cheerfully. It's a way for us to demonstrate an act of trust because when we recognize God as provider and we give, we're saying, Lord, I'm willing to give up a portion because I know you as my provider will continue to provide for me. And so I don't have to have a clenched fist on this. And so it becomes a demonstration of our trust. And I think it allows us to participate in God's activity, which is an incredible blessing. And that's one of the reasons we give so joyfully. So how do we approach the tithe? Well, as you said, it's a starting point. It's a tenth. I think we should give it to the local church and it's on the increase. And that's why this question comes up because when it's less clear, you know, when we get a paycheck, it's obvious. Well, that's a hundred percent of that is my increase with social security. A portion of that, despite the fact there's a gain built in and despite the fact that my employer did a portion of it, a portion of that is clearly a return of what I paid into the social security uh, system uh, to be able to receive this benefit. So I think, you know, it, it, my approach is just to say everything I receive is a gracious gift from the Lord, and I'm going to give back uh, off the top, the the, the gross amount. Um, but, uh, you know, I think ultimately that's between you and the Lord, and you certainly could, you know, apply a certain percentage to it, um, and you would be, and that would be very appropriate. At the end of the day, I just make it a matter of prayer, and then do as the Lord leads. Does that all make sense, though? Uh, yes, yes, because uh, at, the, at the present, I'm still working, and I went ahead and filed for Social Security last year, so okay. uh, yeah. uh, around April. So okay. also, if I can ask, ask another quick question, because yes, I didn't ma'am. tell the guy, um, since I am still working as a teacher's teacher, um, would is there some way I can invest some of that money that I'm getting from the Social Security? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can do with it whatever you'd like. Uh, so you are not full retirement age. Uh, is that is that right? I am. I'm, oh, you yes, are? I'm, six, I'm 60. Well, I just turned 68 uh, on the okay. 2nd of January. Mm-hmm. Okay, very good. Yeah, so there won't be any reduction in that benefit based on your earnings. You'll be able to work and earn as much as you want, and you'll still get your full benefit. Uh, and then you can turn around and do with that whatever you'd like. Uh, so in terms of the priority use of that, I'd make sure you have a fully funded emergency fund of at least six months. And then if you've got surplus beyond that, uh, and you've already done your giving, your bills are covered, you're not looking to increase your lifestyle any, I think turning around and saying, I want to put this money to work, especially in light of what's going on with inflation, you know, that money is losing purchasing power every month just because goods and services are rising. And so, so being able to take that and say, I want to redeploy that in an investment strategy that makes sense for me at 68, uh, you know, that's probably a portfolio of 30 to 40 percent in stocks, which this is a great time to invest, and maybe, uh, you know, 60 to 70 percent in bonds that are more stable and pay a reasonable rate of return. And that total portfolio over time should give you some growth in that. Now, in any given month or quarter or even year, it could be down. You're certainly, you're taking an element of risk anytime we invest, but it gives you the potential if you don't foresee needing this money anytime soon for you to grow it over the next five or 10 years. So that if you needed to tap into it for long-term care or something like that, you know, you'd have uh, some growth on it. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. So what's the best way to find a financial advisor? To go yeah. About do you have one? other investable assets, Cynthia, or uh, would this be uh, kind of the I beginning? I do have a it? IRA. Uh, okay. But, yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what do you have in that account, roughly? About 32000 Okay. All right. And what is that invested in? Is it in mutual funds? Yes, mostly mutual funds. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Uh, I, I'll give you two options. You're probably slightly below what a typical investment advisor would require as a minimum. So the two options you have is one, you could check with our friends at soundmindinvesting.org, soundmindinvesting.org, and they will, uh, they have a very effective strategy where they would make mutual fund recommendations for you. You could open a brokerage account at Schwab or Fidelity. They don't care. And then they would tell you which funds, mutual funds to pick based on your age and your goals. It's a little bit more hands-on because you're actually making the selections yourself based on the input they give you. The other option is more automated. It's what we call a robo-advisor. And uh, you could do that with the Schwab Intelligent Portfolios. Just Google it, Schwab Intelligent Portfolios. You'd open up an account, uh, probably transfer your IRA in, and then you'd have another account for the proceeds from Social Security And it would be an automated approach. After you answer a series of questions, they would automatically invest that money every time you make a deposit. Thanks for calling, Cynthia. We'll be right back. Stay with us. At Faith and Finance, we're on a mission to educate, equip, and connect you and many others with the powerful financial answers found in God's Word. We're working to meet people right where they are through national radio programs, our app, website, and other resources. If you've benefited from this program, would you consider becoming a monthly Faith and Finance patron? Check out all of the benefits of a Faith and Finance patron's membership at faithfi.com and click Give on the homepage. If you're investing for retirement or any other goal, you may be wondering if it's possible to enjoy both profit and peace of mind no matter what's happening in the market. Sound Mind Investing has a short video webinar on that topic at soundmindinvesting.org. SMI has helped tens of thousands of Christians learn to be wise and faithful stewards in the area of investing. Profit and peace of mind no matter what's happening in the market at soundmindinvesting.org. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West. This is the program where the 2300 verses on money and possessions found in God's Word intersect with today's financial decisions and choices. Let's go back to the phones quickly. Uh, WMBI in Illinois. Jessica, you're next on the program. Go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to say I'm a big fan. I always wanted your financial advice. You're one of my fans for here. That's very sweet of you. How can I help? (laughs) Yes. So I'm 36 years old and I wanted to, well, tomorrow I'm just really overwhelmed because tomorrow I'm going to meet with my company's financial um, advisor and I'm going to roll over three other accounts that I had from previous jobs into this company, my company. So I want all okay. my retirement money like in one spot. I think that's a great idea. So what is your advice for my age and like I could get the best um, interest rate for my retirement money and how much money should I put every pay period? Yeah. Okay. Well, you got a lot going on here, Jessica. Let's try to get you some clarity around where you go from here. Um, what type of retirement account do you have available at your new employer? Is it a 401k? No, because it's a non-for-profit, so it's a one, I think it's called 103B. 403B. Okay, yeah, so that's the non-profit equivalent, and you're going to roll your old retirement accounts into this new 403B, is that right? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm glad you have the 403B, and I'm glad that you're going to combine everything into one place because we love simplicity, and that's going to help to simplify things so you're not getting statements and, you know, tax documents from multiple brokerage firms. So having it all in one place is a good thing. To your question about how much to put into retirement, it's ultimately going to be a function of your budget. How much can you actually afford? So after you really examine your, your lifestyle spending and make the hard decisions on what stays and what goes, you're going to ultimately be able to determine after your givings in there, what you have the ability to put away for retirement, plus any other short-term savings needs, a car replacement fund, things like that. If you're saving to buy a house, how much you're putting aside there. In terms of the retirement goal, ultimately you want to try to get that up to 10 to 15% of your take-home pay. Uh, The question is whether or not you have the ability to do that today. You may not. And so you 
you may say, listen, all I can do today is 3% of my paycheck. Well, that's fine. Let's start there. And maybe next year it's four and then five after that. And then maybe you get a raise and you don't change your spending and you can bump it up to eight in one year. But ultimately, we want to get it to 10 to 15%. So that would give you a target. In terms of the uh, Roth IRA versus the 403B, I like you contributing to that 403B, especially if there's matching. Do you know if your new employer is going to match any of your retirement contributions? Um, no, it's just only what I put. Okay. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. I would get more information on that. But I think you contributing to that 403B makes some sense. Because, you know, then you don't have to pick the investments. You could have this representative help you choose the right investments inside the 403B. And there's going to be a menu of options. And based on your age and your goals and objectives, they can help you pick the right ones. And then just try to put as much as you can in there, ultimately getting up to a goal of 10 to 15 percent. With regard to the student loans, don't stress about that. You'll get that done. I think the key is let's create a plan. Again, let's limit your lifestyle spending your expenses. And Mm -hmm. once you do that, you're going to feel a lot better because now that's off your back and you're going to have more every month that you can put toward your other goals. But here's the reality, Jessica, the fact that you're thinking about these things, you're, you're already contributing to retirement. You're trying to get these student loans paid off at 36. You're way ahead of everybody else, um, you know, in this situation. So be encouraged. You're doing the right things. And I think, uh, you know, as long as you Try not to be overwhelmed and, you know, get wise counsel and let's try to simplify things and live well within your means. You're making the right steps that are ultimately going to put you in a really good position down the road. Okay. So don't get an IRA Roth because that is one of the options in the 403B. There's like so many you could. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a Roth option inside the 403B, I would absolutely go with that. Yes. Um, oh. there's like different types of Roth. So what type? Okay. Yeah. You know, there's only going to be one Roth. Uh, the question is just what investments to put inside of it. So I would just tell the person that you're meeting with that you'd like the Roth option with the 403B and I'd try to get as much going in as you can up to 10% of your pay. I'm going to have to scoot, but I appreciate your call. And if you have other questions down the road, you let us know, Jessica. God bless you. Luann in Indianapolis, you're next up. How can I help you? Hi, thanks for taking my call. I have a two-part question, if I can remember both questions. Okay. Um, I have a small IRA. It's 80000 And I have a very small 401k, which is um, 10000 But I'm continuing to contribute to it every, every payday at 9%. Um, I am pretty much debt-free except for my mortgage, which is 69000 Would I be smart to take out the money out of my IRA and pay off my mortgage? Should you pay off that mortgage, how long do you plan to continue to work? Um, I am 63. I can take full retirement at 67. Um, I'll probably work till I'm 70. Okay. I would, as long as you don't have a real conviction to be debt-free, and if you do, then go for it. But if you don't, I'd probably not uh, pay that off right now. If it's fitting into your budget, I think the goal would be to try to get it paid off by the time you retire. But I would rather you let the IRA and the 401k, which are no doubt down with the market, uh, I'd let those recover before you look at taking it out. Plus, I don't want to add, you know, $69,000 to your taxable income in one tax year. So I'd probably just continue to let pay on this as you are. If you're sending extra every month or every year, great. That's going to help you get it paid off sooner. And let's set a goal to pay it off at least by the time you retire or within the first couple of years after you retire. So throwing a couple hundred dollars here and there on the principal, um, I get bonuses like probably yeah. three times a year of $1,500. Throwing that on the principal, would that knock it down pretty quickly? Uh, or is Absolutely, it especially me? since it's down to 69 You know, every $1,000 helps. So yeah, when you can, go ahead and out of current cash flow and pay it down. And that will help you get to the place where by the time you retire in, let's say, four years, maybe you get this thing paid off. Okay, so what about, um, can I work after I start taking full retirement? 
Absolutely. Once you reach full retirement age, you can work and earn as much as you want. It'll have no bearing on your benefits. If you uh, take, uh, if you start taking retirement early, that's where you get penalized. They'll hold back a portion. They'll eventually make that up to you. But once you reach full retirement age, you can work as much as you want, make as much as you want. And in fact, if you're making more than any of your 35 highest years of earnings, it'll actually improve your benefit. Uh, it could actually raise your monthly benefit by you replacing some of those lower income years. So yeah, that's absolutely something you can do. Lou Ann, thanks for your call today. God bless you. That's going to do it for us today, folks. We're so grateful to have you with us today. I want to say thank you to my team, Dan, Amy, and Robert. Couldn't do it without them. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Faith and Finance is provided by Faith by and listeners like you.